Okay. Okay, sorry about the delay, everyone. Um, three minutes delay. And thank you for your patience. Uh, we are really excited to have uh, Semyama Art's first virtual artist uh, talk uh, with uh, Nina and Laura. And before we start, I would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the traditional ancestral and unceded land of the Squamish, uh, Slava Jews, and Musqueam nations. So hi, Nina and Laura. Uh, finally, here we are live. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce you two to our audience with a short bio. Um, Nina Kastasova is a multidisciplinary artist who works with different mediums, particularly oil and watercolor. Her vast body of work includes illustration, conceptual and abstract painting. She was born in Crimea and raised between two worlds, traditional and contemporary, East and West. She was introduced to art at an early age through her community that her family was part of. Her dynamic artistic personality is rooted in being raised in a country with ancient history, rich tradition and multicultural exchange. She studied traditional art at school followed by a bachelor in graphic design and received her master's in art in Ukraine, as well as attended the School of Art Institute in Chicago. After moving to Canada, she decided to make a move to expand horizons and to do something different. She strives to professionally de develop new art techniques on a basis of strong academic and aesthetic fundamentals. She also has been teaching art and design since 2009. Very impressive uh, resume, Nina. And now to uh, Laura. So Dr. Laura Kuhlmann is a cancer researcher and emerging writer from Romania, currently living and working in Toronto. Her short stories and flash fiction have been published online at reflection.com and have been included in several anthologies, including Barely Casting a Shadow, which was in 2018, as well as Voices from 2018 until 2020. She is a member of Sisters in Crime International and is currently editing her first novel, a mystery that brings together scientists and narcotics detectives in the search for a deadly new drug. <laughs> that sounds exciting. So, yeah, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I guess uh, we try to keep this a uh, uh, very open and broad uh, talk, but I just want to uh, start with um, mentioning that uh, you two actually didn't know each other when you collaborated on the short uh, story Mortar and Brick. Uh, so Laura was the um, author of um, Mortar and Brick, which we published on our website and uh, other channels in July. And Nina was the illustrator and the result was very beautiful. Um, how did you two start working together? Yeah, it offers. Well, you know, since I'm starting, um, I would say thank you very much, all those to you personally and also to Simiamo Arts uh, for um, creating this, this opportunity because I think uh, uh, partly I understand the purpose of uh, having this kind of organizations uh, as to be a platform for artists to collaborate. and. I think uh, sometimes it is unexpected and it could lead to those beautiful results uh, and uh, they are empowering for both artists, but also uh, they could be very educational for the communities. Right? Uh, and uh, I would let uh, Laura continue. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I didn't know Nina before uh, before um, uh, Uli introduced us, uh, and initially it was just everything virtual. Uh, thank you so much, Uli and Sanya Arts, for for not only publishing our work and, uh, but also organizing this event. 
um, regarding the collaboration, uh, it went very smoothly. I don't have much to say except the fact that uh, the first uh, uh, pictures that Nina sent to us, I was already pretty surprised because I, I thought, wow, it's very similar to what I had in my mind when I was writing the story. It probably helped that both of us were born um, in Eastern Europe, so we might have had like a common um, uh, cultural background to to draw from. But it was it was very smooth. I remember just seeing it and loving it and feeling that it complements the work wonderfully. And uh, on my side, I should say that uh, when uh, uh, Uli asked me to illustrate the story, and she said. Uh, as soon as possible and I read it and I thought oh this is something I can actually do fast because it speaks to me so you know in so many ways uh, as uh, an artist as uh, someone who is from uh, this part of the world as well as you know uh, someone who uh, immigrated to Canada and uh, you know and then there are many other things like educated person right and woman and and there are so many themes you covered in a story that uh, literally they were like I was seeing myself Right. That's why I think it was easy for me to do it fast. And uh, I think I hope you liked it. Uh, and I, I try to be as much objective as possible uh, as an artist. So I hope it went well. Yeah, actually, that, now that you mentioned, you did uh, uh, deliver your work very fast, like in lightning speed. I was amazed about the quality of work and also the speed. How did you come up so fast with uh, six beautiful illustrations? Uh, well, you know, in fact, you said three, right? And uh, I just didn't think it was sufficient. And I thought, okay, I'll do whatever I can and then I will let you choose. But we end up, you end up uh, choosing all of them, right? And using, I think, all of them. Uh, and I think it was, you know, sometimes I think um, as an artist, you you have to capture the emotion and quickly put it on paper. That's why I think it was my almost immediate, like emotional response to what I was reading, right? And then I did some big sketches, some thumbnail size, um, uh, you know, sketches. And then uh, I thought I can just try uh, basically enlarging in them and uh, coloring them and uh, this is what it is and i like to work in this way just because again there's a freshness of impression and also uh, i think i i had to do some research uh, regarding let's say costumes and uh interior design because uh, illustration involves this kind of things right and i had to read a few times your story in order to um, not to include something that uh, I wanted to say myself, right? Because I have to be true to the nature of their uh, written work, right? Uh, but I think it was just because it was like, you know, the immediacy of, uh, of this, what I read. That's why it was fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we couldn't decide on three, on just three. <laughs> no, they were all really great. I, I, uh, I also agree. And Laura, how does a cancer scientist uh, become an author of a fiction uh, novel or fiction short story? How did you come up with your story? Um, so I, I think you, you become an author if you're a big reader, probably, to begin with. And, I, and that's how it kind of started for me, just the love of getting lost in stories. Uh, also as a way to escape, because uh, I've always been very like science oriented, but at the same time, when, when life got a little stressful, science, science wasn't enough, couldn't uh, help with whatever I had to cope. So I always took refuge in some form of art, be it music or, or uh, the written word. So at one point, I decided to try to write it down. This particular story was... Um, uh, actually, uh, I dug it out of me a little bit when uh, I joined the, a writer's group in Toronto. Uh, and at one point, uh, somebody asked me, I want to hear more about your life in Romania. And then, because um, I was bringing up my crime story to the group primarily, and I didn't dare to bring what's called literary fiction, so more introspective uh, metaphorical stories to the group because I wasn't sure or convinced I can do something that's good enough for you know literary uh, writing um, but that prompted me to give it a try so the first part I wrote was actually the first scene 
and I submitted that to a competition and I won. Uh, so, uh, but when I submitted it five minutes afterwards, I just had a pang feeling that I didn't finish the story. I, I feel like I can't just leave it uh, just uh, as, you know, the revolution is about to end. And the other three parts came, I remember, between Christmas and New Year's Eve a few years ago, like they just poured out of me. And then there was a long process of editing and <laughs> making it better. <laughs> Yes, and there is a probably parallels between editing peer-reviewed uh, um, articles back and forth, like re uh, revise and resubmit, and your editing your short story. For sure, for sure. Um, it, it takes um, there. It's only happened probably twice in my life that I wrote a story and I needed minimum edits. Uh, and it could go and be published. Most of the times I needed to, to present it to some other authors or readers and, and check what's clear and what wasn't and then go at it again and try to clarify or take out parts. It's, it's a constant process. And speaking of approaching um, creative work, uh, Nina, do you want to tell us how you approached uh, your work, uh, like you made, uh, I think, uh, some illustrations to show us how it's uh, obviously not coming out of the ETHEA, it's something, it's a work in progress. Um, do you mm. want me to share the? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, regarding see. the process, right, uh, because I, I feel um, if you're talking about illustration, it's not necessarily an uh, independent piece of work because it still has to um, reflect the storyline, right? And then uh, I had a story, so I had a base to start with. Uh, and I think uh, this is a beautiful part of doing uh, this type of art, of illustration, that you actually have, uh, you have something to start with. Uh, and uh, I think we briefly talked with you, uh, ladies, that um, uh, I was in a position, uh, like in this stage of my life, then I was thinking, you know, always me, it's too much, you know, always reflecting my own story. It's maybe, it's maybe I want to try something else. I want to go outside of my uh, kind of view of the world, of my understanding of the world. And then this one was an opportunity. So I tried before illustrations and uh, because my background is an art, right? So I definitely tried different type of art. And I did, my last one was on the poetry, Ukrainian poetry. And that one was more historical. Uh, and then this one, I think it was for me almost, you know, like I asked and I received it, you know, and then it was an opportunity as well uh, to, to kind of experiment to to go outside as you laura actually also uh, mentioned in your uh, book right then it's something like looking outside of uh, your regular like box right and uh, and then uh, and then so this story uh, came up uh, and i think this is you can see over here i just started with um so i read and i identified key uh moments of what i thought um we didn't have as much time to, I guess, to communicate. And we didn't have uh, an opportunity to discuss with Laura directly uh, what was your idea a little bit more. And, you know, I think in an ideal situation, we, we should have, you know, shared, uh, I mean, uh, we should have communicated this. Uh, but then I think uh, when I, I heard Laura's feedback, uh, it kind of all felt into the place, right? And then, so this one for the first part, uh, I thought this is this uh, one of those key moments when uh, the main character, it, uh, she she's looking outside of this regular uh, environment, right? And she is looking into what is outside. Uh, and then uh, interestingly in that uh, I also, I kind of uh, imagine myself as this girl uh, because I remember also doing this all the time. I remember this idea other uh, but, uh, battery side, which were cold sometimes in 90s or uh, mid uh, or up to 90s even. And uh, I also remember this heavy uh, type of curtains and, uh, you know, like kind of semi dark environment uh, when we didn't have light sometimes or water even, right? 
and grandmother also she was collecting it into uh, big canisters. Uh, so anyways, you know, I thought that this is something that uh, I, I can see myself uh, as well in. And then I first did this kind of, uh, you see right in the corner, uh, on the left side, the small, uh, uh, very tiny sketches, right? Uh, and then tonal sketch, and then I transferred it uh, uh, to bigger paper and then colored it. And uh, for sure, you have to research on all those things as like, let's say, a part of the carpet or uh, what they were. So this one, the scene where... Uh, this? Yes, the second yeah. one. Thank you, Oli. Uh, when uh, uh, grandmother uh, stops a main character uh, from, you know, looking uh, outside of the window, right? Uh, I mean, outside. Uh, and uh, I kind of uh, struggled a little bit more with this one. Um, because I think maybe also because it's a movement and then there are three different characters and uh, image of grandmother and uh, and the light, right? It's like candle light. Uh, and also on the next page, I think, oh yes, this one is also one, uh, what I thought would be a key moment when she's reading, right? And, you're, and I think, Laura, you just said that it was you also who, who liked reading, right? And who kind of, you know, <laughs> Uh, your world was in in the books, right? And then also yours. Uh, and next page was uh, last two, right? This is the last scene uh, when they are in America, July 4th, and then uh, with the professor. And you know, interesting that uh, when I was reading this scene about the professor, and this is what I left uh, when, before coming to Canada, I was actually assistant professor and I was teaching, I was uh, checking the assignments and it was same thing, it was $100 per month and it was half of the rent and then you had to ask or look for other opportunities to make living just to buy your food and then pay other bills, right? So that's why I was like, oh my gosh, this is what was, <laughs> and the, you know, <laughs> yeah, what was happening to me exactly, right? Uh, so that's why, you know, it was easy, I, I would say. So reading, reading the short story, you could uh, draw lots of parallels to your real life experience. Exactly. That's what made it easier. And uh, uh, Laura, is that actually what uh, happened to you? Does your short story draw inspiration from uh, your or your family's life and your upbringing in Romania? I definitely took some inspiration from there, although I decided to not make it autobiographical. Uh, probably the scene that's the closest to what happened is the first one, the 1989 uh, uh, revolution, although it did happen differently, like that we were there with the entire family. Uh, but indeed, everybody was too shocked to realize that a five year old should not be watching an execution live on TV. <laughs> well, it wasn't live on TV, but uh, indeed, that was that the, the big shock that um, that's how we started, you know, uh, our free world, uh, free living uh, uh, after the uh, 1989 revolution. But afterwards, I kind of looked around at the experience of, uh, of several of my friends, uh, because I would say there are two moments of shock in the story. One is the 1989 moment when um, uh, you have the big crumbling of the Iron Curtain. And then it was the 2009 um, uh, uh, crisis, economic crisis, which came with an efflux of uh, several of my friends just decided that, like, we can't fulfill our dreams here, we have to leave. Uh, so while I, I didn't experience everything I described in the story, it is draw, I did draw inspiration from what I noticed around me. So there were several people who had uh, this type of experience, and I'm, I'm Kind of, I can't say that I'm happy that Nina understands what I mean because it means it was a little stressful for her in that time. But um, I am kind of glad to see that it wasn't just an isolated event, that this was something, these type of events were experienced by more people. So um, obviously it means I managed to tap into a, a problem that affected multiple, multiple people. Um, Probably not necessarily just Eastern Germany, Eastern Germany, Eastern Europe, <laughs> uh, but definitely like I, I decided to look around me, put together about, uh, some common elements, and then 
uh, combine them into a story that unifies uh, what it was like growing up post-1989. And then, you know, just as we were about to enter adulthood, experiencing another severe economic crisis. <laughs> right. And a big theme in uh, your story is about differences in values between the different generations. Um, how do you see your values as different and what do you think of older generations and their values and their traditions? I think we're a lot harsher on older traditions and all the values when we're younger. And then as we age, we, we start to have a more balanced view of them. Um, I, I, it's, it's part of uh, any uh, cultural evolution to, to challenge the values, I believe, of, of the older generation. Uh, challenges in my inquire about how much of it does it actually make sense to the new generation? How much of it is fair? Um, how much of it um, is no longer applicable to our, to our situation in general? So uh, it's good to, to challenge old values for sure. Uh, but as we start to, I noticed that as I started to move away from young, uh, as young adulthood into like middle age, um, I noticed that I started feeling more connected a little bit with some of the values of, um, of my grandparents and my parents. So there is obviously not an overlap, but uh, what, once you grow up a little bit and you're not as, um, impulsive as a young adult, you start seeing things in a different uh, light. And definitely, I would say, um, all the, uh, all older values and traditions play an important role um, in defining um, every person. And it definitely plays a, uh, an important role in defining me. But then you take them and you grow your own values on top of that. And I think that makes you a better, stronger person. Nina, I, I'm looking at your um, illustrations, the barbecue scene, and there is like this lightness between the older generation and the younger generation. Did you um, have any um, inspiration or did you learn anything from your grandparents uh, that would take a big uh, um, uh, inspiration for your artistic endeavor? Well, uh Definitely, right? Because we all uh, we all children of our parents, right, and then grandparents as well. And uh, for sure, art came from my grandfather. Right? So he introduced me to art, and I basically I started uh, with his encouragement. Uh, and also in terms of uh, uh, in terms of, for example, what I tried in my life is with the encouragement of my mother, I was able to leave my parents and study away from my home. Uh, so I, get, I got my education uh, far away and then they trusted me, right? And then I think this is when I became an independent think thinker as well as when I left Ukraine as well. Uh, and they, uh, they were supporting me somewhere. Uh, I think with time, uh, we kind of, uh, as I, I guess Laura says, I kind of do thought some things, right? But they kind of allowed or encouraged me to think for myself, uh, which is, I think, uh, uh, very important, right? Mm -hmm. And in the story, um, uh, there is a lot of talk about values that hold a society together. Like the, I guess maybe, Laura, you can explain a little bit more to us what the title mortar and brick refers to there's like a couple of references about i think at some point um the protagonist daria she is explaining how a building is not really alive and you have to breathe life into it and it's just walls and and can you maybe talk a little bit about this values that um you know keep a society together um, I, I think it's values and also a narrative that we construct about uh, about our culture slash society uh, that holds us together. Um, it's also like values and our own narrative holds our personality together throughout life. Uh, the reason I, I titled the piece Modern and Break was because I used in two different places um, 
um, uh, I made references to walls. One was um, uh, the rather creepy but real legend, well, legend in Romania of um, how you need to give, uh, kind of make us a, a bit of a sacrifice to a new building um, in order for the building to, to allow you to live in it. Uh, but at the same time, there was uh, the parallel with the fact that so the, uh, some, some um, a part of the Romanian society did not want to willingly, it, it was a bit of a cultural shock. I will admit 1989 was a big cultural shock. I, I was young when it happened, but for a lot of people, um, it was a very abrupt transition. So some people didn't manage to make the transition to the new economy and the new culture that came with it very smoothly. And there were people who were very attached to the older values and traditions, um, which in a way didn't work very well for, <laughs> uh, for the society. Um, and that's when I mentioned the, uh, the, um, the wall that never really fell, uh, that some people would ha still have a hard time letting go of the old way of doing things because um, the, the new world is a little scary. It is a little scary. Um, and that's why I said the world, ne the world never fell. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, values are definitely important, but it's like going back to what I said before, it's important to also be able to challenge them. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is a uh, parallel, something we can learn right now being in a pandemic and needing this, this glue that sticks us together and maybe, I don't know, gives us some, some sense of sanity or, yeah. I, I was thinking of that when I was rereading your story again, that we, we might need um, a common denominator that uh, keeps everyone at the same level so that we know why we're here. <laughs> um, yeah. And you two have something in common. Uh, you're obviously both female um, and both very educated, and but you also are um, brave women who came from another country all by themselves to this country. Um, do you, so, yeah, do you think when you, when uh, uh, Nina, when you were reading Laura's story and it was easy for you to connect, um, did it help you um, because of your, you know, that this shared background that you both have? Uh, sorry, I got uh, distracted a little bit. Uh, um, can you can you uh, repeat the question? Sorry about that. Um. Um, okay, so I was asking um, because you two have so many common common things together um, because you you both come from a different country, you immigrated by yourself. Um, you're both in, um, educated. Would you say when you were reading Nina's, uh, when you were reading uh, Laura's uh, story without knowing Laura, without knowing the, the story, but you came up so quickly with the illustrations, was your background and this connection uh, helpful for you? Uh, well, I think so. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure what is uh, Laura's uh, plan for the story, but I thought it's kind of also, it was unfinished. <laughs> Because it, it, it keeps going, right? And then the way you add it up, I think it's beautiful because it, it's never the end, right? It, it keeps going, it continues, right? Uh, it's just one of those uh, moments or stages or, you know, that you go going through uh, or you learn. And, and that's why I liked it because it wasn't so clear cut. It wasn't so, you know, like uh, kind of strong in, in opinion, but it was more, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, I would say, uh, like carefully shaped. Uh, and I think it spoke to me, I mean, the style, stylistically. Uh, and I think, yeah, there were a lot of common things, right? Uh, a lot of like how the perception of uh, other people, perception of you, right, as an immigrant. Uh, but I, start, uh, I, I try not to think about this because there are also, like Laura, I think you maybe described in the story, uh, there's other things you 
you get the energy from or you get there uh, you know possibly you get inspired by so there are other uh, universal or something like stronger than uh, what is going around you or you know this uh, experiences which definitely shape your art and your uh, your perception of world but still there's a core inside of your right? age uh, which keeps you going as an artist Okay, nice. Yeah, beautifully said. Um, so according to Hill Strategies, uh, which is a research lab in, I think they are based in Ontario, 55% um, uh, of, uh, sorry, 52% of artists in Canada are female. And within that 55 um, are, oh, sorry, 52% of artists in Canada are female and 55% uh, are um, authors. So there is like a big um, percentage of authors within the artist realm um, who are female. Um, however, at the same time, um, the income of artists notoriously is very low. <laughs> they make a uh, median income of uh, about $25,000 uh, per year, which is below the poverty threshold. Um, what is your advice to young emerging, this is a question posed to both of you, what is your advice to young emerging artists of like all genres, um, particularly female artists, how would you, what would you tell them to balance uh, the um, challenge between, you know, their passion for creativity, but also the need, obviously, to make a living? Julia tends to ask very philosophic questions. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, what was that? Very philosophical questions. Oh, sorry, yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's important, right? Like we are, we have to live off something, right? It's nice to be so talented like you two are, but uh, you also have to survive. And uh, this is, uh, it, it's not rocket science that artists are notoriously uh, poor. There is, there is different artists, like there is the creative class uh, defined by Richard Florida, which is, you know, the designers and the architects who might, might make more money, but then the, the, you know, painters and authors and um, illustrators, they actually statistically, they are on the lower end of the income level. Yeah, one joke I heard actually from a friend of mine was, he asked me what's the difference between an author and a large pizza and the reply uh, he gave me was, uh, um, yeah, a large pizza will feed a, a family of four. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, so I think most, uh, uh, sorry, Nina, you wanted to go first? No, go ahead, Laura. Um, so yeah, I, th I think for most authors I know, the majority of them actually, their main income is from something else and then they, they do their writing when they can in between, like either they, they write every morning or every evening or whenever they can in between. Um, what advice I would give to an emerging writer, because I, I can't speak for other um, forms of art, um, is if, if you feel that it's really burning inside of you, you really have to do this. Because one advice I also got was, if you can quit it, quit it, because it takes time and it's not gonna make you a lot of money. Very true. But if it's really burning inside of you, uh, there are two main things to start with. First, keep doing it because it's probably important for your health, for your mental and <laughs> physical health, uh, but be ready to not be very successful right away. So it, it not be successful right away. You might, you will probably hit a lot of walls, uh, but just you need to persevere and not be despondent. And probably another second important advice is just find a group of friends um, that are uh, willing uh, to, uh, to give feedback and help you improve uh, your craft because Talent is overrated. Everybody goes on talent. Well, everybody went on talent when I was young. And then as I uh, grew up, I realized that we keep putting talent first, but talent will not make up for, uh, for just doing it and doing it again. That's how you get better. 
Um, and uh, so I, I, for example, I was considered to be a very poor writer and I was. Um, and then I just loved it and I kept doing it. And at one point I got better. Now I'm not noble material by any means. Uh, but where I am now and where I used to be, is, it's quite a big difference. So I got there because I loved it. I kept doing it and I got really useful feedback. Uh, and maybe you, you said, what about female artists? There's only one piece of advice I would have to do to give you if, if you happen to be a female artist that would not, let's say, be universal. Um, if you feel uncomfortable, because artists are a little... Uh, extravagant. We are. That's fine. That's, um, um, people will be, you'll be surrounded by very interesting people. Um, but extravagant should not be confused for harassment. If you do realize you're encountering harassment in your group of, of artist friends, um, quit it as soon as possible. So it did unfortunately happen to me a couple of times that I, I realized there were people who would not respect my boundaries. Um, and the only thing I regret was that I didn't quit it sooner. I just felt an obligation to, to try to work it out. But if you feel uncomfortable, if, if, it's, if somebody's not making you feel comfortable, just let them go and you focus on your path because that way you're, you're focusing all your energy on, on the people and, uh, that matter and on the things that matter to you. So don't be afraid to just set up boundaries. Good advice, great. And Nina, what about you? Uh, well, to, to answer to your statistics, which you told, I just feel like, well, if uh, there are so many uh, female artists and uh, authors specifically, I think then it means that the story is not finished, that it's untold. So it means that we have to hear more. It means that it's not enough, right? It means not enough for the society. It means we have to keep going, right? We have to tell our story. We have to crystallize it. We have to say it many times. Maybe we have to form some kind of, you know, different, uh, maybe uh, philosophy around it. Uh, I'm not sure, right? It means it has to be more than and then uh, in terms of um, uh, art for the future uh, generations, uh, I feel, you know, um, if you choose to be an artist as a means of profession, you have to be ready for insecurities, for certain insecurities. It's not the type of lifestyle where you will figure out at once and you will take advantage of this right, for the rest of your life. No, it's like you have to reinvent yourself literally every time you do it. Like every time you have to be ready for downfalls and you have to just wake up, stand up and go, right? You have to find also what bothers you, right? Every time it's a new, right? So you have to basically, uh, like it, it, sometimes it's just like this, it bothers you and you don't know what is that. So you, the first step would be just to ask, yourself a question what is this and dig down dig down right and it's not comfortable right it's very you know unpleasant sometimes sometimes there is also no answer to this like how to figure it out and then it takes courage it takes uh, time as well and uh, it just you know if you love it you will do it uh, I feel like you know uh, you probably can uh, succeed if like for me for example I understand success is where you put your energy in and then you produce some kind of result, right? And it's not, I think in art specifically, the success, it's not the money, it's not the fame. I think it's basically figuring it out and it's the process. And in, in art, I think this is the process-based uh, lifestyle or path, let's call it path. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so to summarize what you both said, uh, key components of being successful as an artist is uh, resilience, persistence, and patience, which could actually pertain to anything in life that we do or want to do and that looks so challenging, right? But I mean, you two are good examples of uh, breaking the uh, wall and uh, making it, <laughs> so obviously you must have done something right and learned something from your journey of becoming artists. Um, so we are actually almost uh, at the 45 minutes. Um, 
uh, Alexander, I forgot to introduce Alexander. Alexander is our wonderful marketing coordinator who is uh, right now as a disappearing ghost joining our Zoom meeting, just making sure everything is working properly. Uh, hey, do we have any questions, Alexander, from the audience? It's like... Uh, <laughs> it's like talking to a ghost. <laughs> we can't see him and hear him. <laughs> no, no, we jump forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we do have um, a few questions. Uh, so, uh, one is, uh, what was the first piece of literature or art that uh, stuck with you? So, I guess this question pertains to both of you. Or I would let you go. <laughs> I need to think. <laughs> um, funny enough, I think that the first uh, the first reactions I had, the, the strongest reactions I had were probably to music as a child. I think I first latched on to music. Uh, my mom was a big fan of, of um, uh, classical music. So I, I, I think... The first time I reacted strongly to art was to, to classical music, in particular piano concertos. Um, uh, I, I think I was able to identify the moon sonnet before I was capable of speaking very well. <laughs> Wow! <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had the, uh, the year, I recognized it by year, and my mom has a story that I was... Uh, about two years old, and I heard uh, the moon sonnet on ra on the radio, and I went to the, it was night, and I went to the window, and I pointed out and start, tried to say the moon. Uh, so, <laughs> um, in, in terms of part, piece of art, I, I, there is, I know I said I was a big reader, but I actually became a big reader about the eight, about uh, when I turned 14, because up until then, I didn't really like the classics, like Alexandre Dumas didn't really jive with me. He was too flowery. And I, I blame my mother again for this. Um, um, she, uh, she decided when I was about to start high school, we fi I finally didn't have a to-read list. And she said, okay, I'm going to give you something to read. And she brought out Rebecca Daphne de, from, by Daphne du Maurier. And that was the moment I realized I love stories. I just don't like the very classical stories. I like darker stories, but I love this story. And I think that was the moment when I, when I, uh, my mother allowed me to start picking my own books. And I realized that I go for the more weird, darker, and that's the stories I started liking. <laughs> Those are the stories I started liking. Okay, so a child protege who discovered a love for dark stories. <laughs> <laughs> I was 14. <laughs> oh, okay. Good. All into dark, <laughs> Laura? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then which artists inspire you the most and what is it about them that you admire? Well, I can probably say that... Um, for me, uh, it's never the only one. Uh, and um, I think kind of to fit our conversation today, I'm thinking of uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, uh, who was female artist and great, uh, but the mother of modern art, right? Uh, but also, I'm, um, I just came back from Russia and I'm under influence of Russian art right now. And I think it's a great collection in Tretyakov uh, Gallery and uh, also the Russian Museum and Hermitage, St. Petersburg and Moscow, incredible. Uh, and I think for any artist who, uh, who is still, you know, on the way of uh, forming their own style, uh, St. Petersburg is a great place to go and, you know, to look into this uh, a little bit different, right? There's a lot of academic art there, but also there's, you know, you can generalize. Uh, so I'm, for example, under influence of uh, illustrators like Vilibin, a Russian artist, but also uh, there are Krepin, Serov, uh, Kramskoy, and they are the masters. And you know, and still you can see it in their influence in Russian in uh, nowadays Russian art is very strong, right? Because the the things they look at uh, they they influence what you do right now. 
Yeah, speaking of uh, a Russian art, is that your paintings in the background? Uh, this is unfinished. <laughs> So it's there because sometimes I need to, you know, in order to finish, I need to see it for some time. And sometimes it just comes to you like, you know, early morning or late at night and you see, oh, yeah, it has to be that. You know, I have to add this here. And then this is uh, another piece here. Yes, of course. Uh, my place is full with art. I change it all the time. So I redesign. My apartment is never the same. <laughs> I work from home. So all my art is here. What a luxury to be able to change our beautiful art uh, at your convenience. Yeah. So there is a more um, a question. So some audience questions. Have either of you noticed that the COVID pandemic has increased collaboration opportunities in your fields as more artists try to make a living during these difficult times so yeah is there more uh, collaborations due to covid and financial pressure i guess Laura, do you want to start uh, i don't really have a, a, a good answer here i just um, um to be honest with you accepting the collaboration with nina i actually did not have a lot of collaborations for publications the only thing that happened during those times uh, uh, since the shutdown started was uh, uh we were able to to meet online more so we, we continue to support each other uh, via zoom meetings um and in a way like we had time to pass back and forth manuscripts uh, a little more, but not to, uh, it, it was more in the form of supporting each other uh, and less oriented towards let's publish this, let's make money out of it. I would say it was more in the support department for me. That was my experience. Mm -hmm. and, and for me personally, I think um, uh, all this pandemic situation, in fact, you know, it kind of even helped me to stay inside and to think a little bit more on what I am doing. So rather than, you know, uh, just like starting there, uh, starting there or doing a little bit there, that kind of uh, actually gave me an opportunity not to be distracted by external world as much in the beginning. Uh, and then later on, I think uh, collaboration, you know, it just, I think uh, COVID shaped it in a different way, right? Because before it was different type of collaboration. Before it was like, let's say murals outside or some kind of maybe teaching presentations and now it's all via online and then I think it's just different type of platform I mean uh, and then it's exploration and I think this is the world we are going to live in uh, and I think this has just kind of pushed it or speed it up a little bit more uh, but this is my impression uh, at this point it may change <laughs> yeah yeah this is we have to get used to it for quite a while huh yeah Okay, so I guess uh, we are at the end of our wonderful talk. Uh, final question, where can people reach you <laughs> in case somebody wants to buy one of your arts or uh, hire you <laughs> to write a story? <laughs> Is, um, do you have a website or do you, I guess, uh, you know, we can pass your information to whoever is interested in reaching out to you yeah i'm still working on a website i'm going to uh, at the moment i i have a twitter which uh, is i think is now linked to simian uh to to your twitter um but i'm still working on a website something that i i have planned on planned on doing um uh, yeah at the moment i'm available on twitter where you can also find a link to my science writing uh because i i every other month i usually write a small article for my um, employer, which is kind of uh, addressing different scientific issues um, or topics for a wide audience. Uh, and occasionally, when I manage to get something published, which is not very often, I also link that there. <laughs> is science actually an inspiration for you? Do you like get ideas through your yeah. logical I work that you do? Yeah, I, and I think it's I think it's more fun this way. Like I'm trying to do to I'm learning something about an experiment, and then I have the what if. Uh, and yes, I did actually write a couple. The craziest story I've written was a story from the perspective of a, of a cell in the immune system, which I just completed. Uh, and and uh, and her story as she's trying to. 
uh, you know, if you realize she's been transplanted in a new body and she is in trouble and trying to uh, to to stay alive, and uh, and that was definitely very scientific. And I tried to like simplify it to not make it a science story and make it actually a literature story. I'm kind of intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to read this. <laughs> yes, yeah. You have to let us know when the story is coming out somewhere. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Okay, ladies, thank you very much for your time um, and you know, wonderful talk, wonderful uh, uh, inspirations and uh, talents, um, and also thank you for collaborating on the mortar and brick project together. I think it was a very great project. We had a lot of good feedback. Uh, hopefully in the future, maybe who knows, you two collaborate again <laughs> and come up with another great project. <laughs> thank okay. you. Yeah, thank you. And you have a good night. I know it's a little bit late uh, in Toronto. It's like eight, nine. Only nine o'clock. Nine <laughs> okay, good. But enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. We hope you liked it and enjoyed it. And Alexander, thank you very much um, for organizing this. And we will um, publish uh, uh, Laura's and Nina's uh, information when we make the post-artist talk uh, marketing. So people can reach you or see your Insta handle or Twitter handle. Okay? All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.